Welcome back to the swamp, my friends. Today we are going to be trudging through the swamps in the woods to try to find some allegedly true encounters with skimwalkers and wendigos. Now, as always, it is up to you whether you believe these stories or not. I'm not trying to convince anybody. But if you have a story that you would like to share, be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp. The stories like yours to help keep this channel going. Now, without further ado, let's get into these creepy Skimwalker and Wendigo stories that'll keep you up tonight. As I write this, I'm still not sure what I truly saw, but I believe it was a skimwalker or something like that. For clarification, I live in North Australia. I hope this helps. I was invited to go on a short camping trip with a friend of mine who I'll call Alan. I met up at his house early around 9am and we talked and watched some TV for a few hours before heading out. The place we were heading to was a deep forest high up in some mountains. I didn't know the area that well since I had just moved there so I was not sure what the place was called. The trip there was quite pleasant, as I and Alan talked and enjoyed each other's company. It was nice to catch up with a friend. Once we arrived, we parked the car and started unpacking our equipment. We started setting up our tent and getting ready to start a fire to cook our food. At around 11pm, Alan said he was probably going to head to bed as he got up early that morning and was getting tired. I wanted to stay up a little longer and just take in the fresh air and view of the forest. After about 10 minutes or so, I had to go to the bathroom, so I decided to go out into the woods and do my business. I didn't wander too far, but far enough that I wouldn't attract any animals or lose sight of the camp. Once I was done, I started to head back to the camp, and then I saw it. A very skinny looking dog like creature was standing in the middle of the campsite. The thing was unnaturally skinny and its limbs seemed contorted like it got hit by a car. However, the creature walked as if it was natural. It walked on four limbs and was very graceful with its movement. It was extremely slow and lanky. I didn't know what to do other than stand at the tree line and watch it. The creature then started to head towards Alan's tent. I was feeling incredibly uneasy at this point, not sure if this creature was dangerous or not, but by the way it looked, I would believe that it is. The thing sniffed at the entrance of Alan's tent for just a few moments, and suddenly started to scratch softly as if it wanted to get in. Then, with one swift motion, the creature stood up on two legs, it must have been at least 8 feet tall, this thing was massive. Then, it just ran away in the opposite direction of where I was standing, straight into the woods. I probably waited for at least 5 minutes before deciding to come out of hiding and go back to my tent. As I got in and tucked myself into my sleeping bag, I heard a loud screech that sounded like a combination of a man and a pig. It sent chills down my spine. I barely got any sleep that night. In the morning, Alan can tell that I was bothered by something and asked me, Hey man, are you okay? Seems like something's on your mind. I asked him if he had ever heard anything at night near his tent, and he told me that he slept through the whole night. He of course was curious now and started to ask me if something was outside our tent. I knew he wouldn't believe me, so I just said that a stray dog was snooping around the camp. I still don't really know what I saw. I know for sure it wasn't some stray dog. If someone could please tell me what I saw, or at least give me an idea of what it could be, I would really appreciate it. After some research, I think it might be a skimwalker, but it does kind of sound similar to a dog man. I don't know. My mom got a new place in Lake Travis, Texas, and we have a big backyard so I wanted to ride my dirt bike. As such, I got some gas and started riding it. We have some old cars right in front of our fence that has a track behind it, and at this time, 
I was already getting a strange feeling, but I shrugged it off and continued writing until I did my final loop around the house, and that's when I saw it. There was a dark figure just behind the fence looking at me. I was in total shock, realizing what I was looking at. I almost started to cry, and so I turned my dirt bike off and dropped it before running back into the house. I told my mom and her roommate, and they told me that before us, there was a crippled old man that used to own this house, and he killed himself, and they said that it might have been him. My room is kind of weird. When you walk in, you see my bed to the left, and to the right is my brother's bed with a window right above it. I wasn't allowed to have the dogs in my room, but I said to myself, screw that, I'm getting my dog. So I went to go get my dog, and as I did, there's a clear glass sliding door that leads out to the porch, and there it was looking at me. I grabbed my dog and went into the room, shutting the door I didn't have a lock, so I put a chair and a small nightstand to keep whatever that thing was out of my room. Later that night, I forgot all about it, and then I heard taps at the window. My heart sank. I knew what it was. My dog bolted up looking at the window, growling and barking up against my bed. I ran into my closet with my dog. I locked my closet door before using my phone to call my grandparents that lived up the road. They came and got me, and I told them about the encounter. My grandma doesn't really listen to me, but this made her listen. She then told me that I was part Navajo, and I more than likely just encountered a skimwalker, and that I should never go back to that place. My mom moved out about five months later. It was nighttime, and I was with some friends of mine and we were in a dark neighborhood with very little light. I have no idea what we were doing there or what we were planning to do, and I don't even remember really what was going on before. One of my old friends, we'll call her Emma, started telling us all of this weird story of hers that a skimwalker inhabited her body, and I guess it comes out if not taking the right precautions. She said it was kind of like a possession type of thing, she was still Emma, but there was apparently a skimwalker too. She said something like, I kill myself all the time, so don't stare, don't blink, and run, and don't look back. Regardless of who Emma was in her human life, the skimwalker inside her had given her a sense of immortality. I don't know what blinking had to do with it, but in my dream, I couldn't stop, like there was something in my eye. Then. We all heard this terrifying, loud, gut-wrenching scream, and we all knew what it was, so we all took off running in different directions. I ended up in a house I was completely dark inside, but I could see. The screams were like these horrid, screeching sounds, but you can hear Emma screeching as well inside those screams. This made this dream even more terrifying. I remember running in the house looking for somewhere to hide and I ran into the skimwalker. It had found me, and I just remember seeing the glowing yellow eyes. It got me, and that's it. I woke up right after. I don't know what this dream means. It was oddly specific. I haven't spoken to Emma in years. I wasn't reading or even talking about skimwalkers at all. It was just an odd dream all around. I hope dreaming of a skimwalker doesn't mean anything, but if anybody has some insight, I would appreciate it. I also live in southern Arizona, so these stories aren't uncommon whatsoever, and everybody knows about these things. I figured this would be the best place to share this. So this isn't one of those stories that involves a near-death experience, but to this day I still can't explain what I saw. For context, I am a 6 foot male who weighs around 150 pounds and I'm in my early 20s. I am also an avid outdoor enthusiast. I have been hiking and backpacking for over a decade, and I enjoy rock climbing and mountaineering. I spent about 7 years in search and rescue, and have some stories from my experience, but nothing really creepy or unexplainable from my time there. Anyways, I have spent a fair amount of time outdoors 
and over the past year had taken up solo hiking and backpacking. Normally, I would try to go out with some friends, but I honestly enjoy the solitude and self-reliance that I have often neglected, even asking my friends to go unless I absolutely need more people. On a rainy November day, I decided to go hiking up to Green Mountain Lookout in the Cascade Mountain Range of Washington State. I had intended on spending the night there in an old fire lookout. I checked the map and the trailhead is rather remote by Washington standards and it involved something like 26 miles of driving on a partially paved old forest service road. I drive up the road and I'm surprised to see just one other vehicle there. To call it a parking lot would be an overstatement. It was really just a wide spot on the old road that could probably fit maybe six vehicles in total. The road meandered past the parking area and curved. While it was a weekend, the weather is rather foul and above 5,000 feet. The rain should be turning to snow, so honestly I wasn't really expecting to see any other people. I park and open my door and start getting my pack ready. There is a light drizzle and I notice how quiet the woods are. Normally there is a fair amount of ambient noise if you listen for it in any forest. The only noise I could hear was the water dripping off the leaves and trees. I chalk it up to being late fall that most of the birds have migrated to warmer climates, the bugs were hiding due to the rain, and it was daytime and the other animals would be seeking shelter from the elements and sleeping from a night of foraging. I start hiking, and I am enjoying the gradual uphill climb of the trail. Now, because of my time in search and rescue, I enjoy tracking. Anytime I'm on a trail, I usually face the ground and like to track other hikers, animals, and other things like that to keep my skills sharp. I notice that there are two sets of trail running shoes, one larger and one smaller. After the first mile or so, that trail leaves the confines of the Doug Fir and Western Hemlock Forests to open up to lush green alpine meadows. In the summer, the alpine meadows bloom and you can see verdant green Indian ellibore, yellow asters, and red columbines, white glacier lilies, bright blue lupins, and orange Indian paintbrush. In the fall though, these meadows are just green with the dying brown stalks of once beautiful plants. Right at the interface of the alpine meadows to the forest, I meet the two other hikers, a man and a woman coming down. As is customary for hiking on the west coast, you swap trail condition information. I give the hikers a once over and notice they both have trail runners on. They tell me that it gets snowy up past the first section of alpine meadows and that it started snowing at around 3 a.m. But they had the trail to themselves today no bear sightings, which makes sense as there are no mountain blueberries in November. We wish each other well and I continue hiking. The trail opens up to a beautiful valley flanked by alpine meadows, forests, slide, alder, and other mountains. When the view is clear, you can see the North Face Glacier Peak to the south. The trail switch backs up the alpine meadows and through a few corpses of trees. I hike up another mile and a half, or so, and then I reach the snow level. It is the first snow of the season, and the snow level was about 5,000 feet, just as predicted. I continue hiking a bit more, until I notice more tracks in the fresh snow. There are two sets. One set of tracks is of a very large dog, likely a Mastiff or a Bernese Mountain Dog given the size. The second set is of a pair of morel hiking boots or shoes, around size 15 or larger. Normally I wouldn't care too much about these tracks, but something did not add up. First, there was only one other vehicle in the parking area. Second, I had not noticed these tracks before in the mud and surely would have if I correctly identified the other hikers tracks. Thirdly, why did these prints just pop up in the snow halfway up the trail? I know that there are no trails on the backside of Green Mountain that intersect with this trail that I'm on, as it is rather remote. It could be a hunter, but that would be unlikely given the difficult access to this particular point in the trail, and the fact that the two hikers I encountered said they were all alone. All this gives me a weird feeling. 
At this point, I am reminded that the forest is still very eerily quiet. There are strange tracks that should not be here. It is snowing. Wet. And I could not actually stay overnight in the old lookout because it is locked. The aura of the area just feels ominous. I listen to my gut instinct and decide to go back to my car. So I turn back. I hike down about a mile. And I am on one of the last switchbacks before the trail re-enters the forest when something catches my eye. And I stop. I am looking down an alpine meadow enjoying the view when I spot something maybe a thousand vertical feet and a less than a kilometer away from my location. I squint and see pure white down in the meadow. As I am looking at this white shape, my mind is trying to fathom what the shape could be. My initial thought is that it looks like one of those 2010 Winter Olympics Inukshuks statues, which resembles a man. All I could see is the head and shoulders part, as the rest would be obscured by the underbrush of the alpine meadow. This thing was standing on a 40 degree slope. The more I stare at this thing, the more confused I become. I rationalize that it cannot be snow on a tree or something because this was the first snow of the season and it was 2,000 vertical feet above this thing. I guess it could be a sun bleach something, maybe a sun bleach white tree stump, but this is unlikely as this area has not been logged before. And this spot was in an alpine meadow, not the forest. It really stuck out, and given the size of this thing, and at the distance, it would have to be an ancient stump to be that large. My guess is that it would have been about 10 feet tall to be that large in this distance. I shuffled in my pocket to put on my gloves, and when I look back, it appears this thing has moved ever so slightly. On the head, I can make out two black spots that were eyes, at least I think where I should be, and a black slit where a mouth would be. I freaked out because in that minute, I was watching this thing, it had not moved, and the five seconds I looked away, it seems to look toward me. I feel chills running down my shoulders and back. What the hell is this thing? It is a half mile away from me. I am still well over a mile from the car. It feels like I am now being watched. I feel an uneasy sense of dread in my stomach. Now, as there are black bears in the cascades, I always carry bear spray with me. My only other weapon is my pocket knife, which is deep in my backpack. Smart, I know. I unholster the bear spray and I slowly make my way down the trail. At this point, I was really wishing I had brought my 357 Magnum, but it weighs 6 pounds and I just can't justify bringing that. At this point, I feel like a fool for neglecting that crucial essential. Before I reach the forest, I keep my body facing the area this thing is in. Once I reach the forest, I am reminded just how silent it is. The forest started out quiet. Now it was silent. No wind and just the occasional drip of rainwater. It feels like there is an apex predator in the forest and it isn't me. I still feel watched. At this point, my own nerves are starting to get the better of me, and I pick up my pace to a jog downhill. I was cognizant that you should never run from a predator, as it will trigger its instincts to run down prey. I felt like prey, and I didn't like it, but I did rationalize that I had maybe a 10 minute lead on this thing, assuming it moves as fast as a person. I start running as silently as I can down the trail, constantly looking over my shoulder while trying to keep my eyes on the ground and not trip over the wet roots and rocks. I never heard any sounds of pursuit from this thing, but I was scared and in full flight or fight mode, and I was flying out of this place as, I, as fast as I could. After a long 15 minutes, I finally reached my car, and it is the only one in the parking area. I throw my backpack into my Subaru jump into the driver's seat and peel out. I have been stalked by mountain lions, hiked through bear country, and had been shot around by hunters on one occasion. But none of my previous experiences can compare to the soul-crushing dread I was feeling once that thing turned and looked at me. I went hiking back up to Green Mountain looking for more information that following summer. I went to the same spot that I saw that thing, and while the underbrush of the alpine meadow was higher, there was absolutely no white shape in that area. 
While I could have brushed off the feeling of dread as my own paranoia, at the quiet forest and a weird dog and human footprints in the snow, I can't rationalize how that white shape was there one day and gone eight months later. That disparity is why it still gives me the chills to this day. This happened when I was 17 years old. I am now 30 and it's the first time I've talked about this in 10 years. After listening to some experiences on this channel, I've decided to share mine. I'll start off with some background information. I've always loved the outdoors and grew up always playing outside and exploring up in the mountains for fossils, wildflowers, or anything I could find that interested me. My mom loved flowers and gardening so sometimes I would go just to find her as many wildflowers as I could to bring back to her. I won't give my exact location away for privacy reasons, of course, but we lived in a very rural community, away from town in the heart of the Appalachian Mountains. When I say away from the town, I mean everyone who lives here is about a 20 minute drive from even the nearest gas station or grocery store. As if that isn't far enough, we lived away from our neighbors, taking a gravel road off the main road up into the narrow valley in between two mountains. The school bus only ran on the main road, so I had to walk this gravel road early in the morning to the main road to catch the bus. It was pretty far away from the school, so I had to catch the bus really early. In fall and spring, it was always still dark when I got to the bus. Any time I went up into the mountains or walked down my road to the bus in the dark or any time when it was dark for that matter, I'd always take my dog with me. He was a beagle mix and was very intelligent. He would walk right by my side or a little in front of me. If he got too far ahead of me for my comfort, I would yell at him to wait and he would stop and look back at me until I caught up with him. He would also sit beside me till I got on my bus and then I would watch him through the windows, walking back up to my road. He was my dad's hunting dog, and my guardian. Although being a pretty small dog, he didn't scare easily. I've seen him chase coyotes out of our yard and wrestle raccoons bigger than him, and bark and snap and bounce around at a bear that used to come around sometimes. All that being said, I'll get into my encounters. The first time wasn't really an actual encounter, but more of something that was very strange and left me rather uneasy. My dog and I, whose name is Fred, were walking down my gravel road to the main road to catch the school bus. We made it to the main road and I was waiting for the bus when Fred and I heard some type of weird shrill scream come up from the way in the mountain on the other side of the main road. It was very loud, but still sounded too far away for me to really freak out. I just looked down at my watch and looked at Fred who was now standing up, looking in the direction of the scream, with his ears pinned back. So he had heard it too. Luckily, just a minute or two later, the bus came and I got on and sat down and watched my dog start back up our road. It was a pretty long drive to school, so I sat and thought about what I had heard. Now, I've lived in the middle of nowhere my entire life and have seen and heard many different animals and it didn't sound like anything I have ever heard before, which made me a little unsettled. After getting to school and being around my friends and doing my work, the thought of it left my mind. That was until the next morning. I was waiting on the bus again, Fred by my side when we heard it again. Except this time, it sounded closer than the morning before, which freaked me out a little more. I looked at Fred again, standing up, staring towards the noise with his ears pinned back again. But this time he got up and sat in front of me rather than beside me. Thankfully, the bus came and I hurried on and sat down, looked out the window to see Fred still sitting there staring up in the mountains instead of walking back home. So later that evening, when I got home from school, I was relieved to see that he went home after I had gotten on the bus. This went on every morning that week, and each time it sounded like it was a little closer than before. Then, after like four days, it just suddenly stopped. A couple of months went by without hearing anything, so it left my mind and I didn't give it another thought. By now it was summer and I usually walked up in the mountains in front of my house about once a week when it was warm. 
It was going to be a really nice day out the next day, so I planned the night before to go to the mountains and make an all day thing out of it rather than just a few hours. So I got up and the next morning at about daybreak and proceeded to pack my backpack with some sandwiches and drinks, my pocket knife which I always took with me and I wasn't allowed to mess with my dad's guns so I just took his hunting knife and a makeshift spear I had made which just was a thick sturdy stick I used for walking with a tip sharpened down to a very narrow point. I woke my mom up before I left and told her I was leaving and the area around where I was going and that I would be gone all day not to worry if I wasn't back in my normal 2-3 hours. This was in 2006 and I didn't have a cell phone because they didn't work in my area anyway because of the mountains so she just told me not to, you know, get in any trouble and to obviously not forget to whistle if I needed help which as far as I intended on going this day probably would have done not much of any good anyway but I took it so she wouldn't worry as much so Fred and I set off up the trail I had up the mountain and when I meant mountain I mean having to literally climb a mountain you need to have a walking stick or hold on to trees to pull yourself upward and keeping my feet sideways to avoid sliding down the steep hill it was a beautiful day and it wasn't miserably hot out I could hear birds and squirrels scuttering about as we were making our way up the hillside off in the distance I spotted a skunk Fred acted like he was going to run towards it so I told him no and to stay away from that and he just sat down and looked at me disappointed we kept our distance from it and walked away we kept going on into the opposite direction once I was sure we were out of this thing's stink zone, we continued up the hill to where I knew it leveled off a bit so I could sit down and rest and get a bite to eat. About 45 minutes later we came into a clearing of a wide level spot where the trees weren't so thick. I sat down on a tree and got my backpack and pulled out my food and had lunch. Having it with Fred, I had found a big leaf and poured in some water for him to drink. We sat there for a while, after eating and seeing a couple of does come into the clearing, but when they noticed us they hurried back off into the brush. This has always been as far as I've been, and is usually where I head back. I decided since I still had some daylight left I'd keep going up the hill, since I've never been further than this. We started going farther up the hill, and I took my time this time, and kept in mind the way back to the clearing since I'd never been this far before and watching my steps because there were a lot of mountain breaks in the area. We made it almost to the top of the mountain. Fred went over to the big pile and sat on my backpack, and I began to look through my backpack. I found a lot of cool fossils, so this got me excited. There were a lot of them, so I was there for a few hours breaking apart layers of rocks, looking through them. I was there longer than I realized and when I looked at my watch it was about 7.30 p.m. So I would have to move quickly if I was going to make it back home before dark. So I put the fossils I found in my backpack and started down the hill. I didn't go straight back down towards the clearing and decided to go back down a different way to learn a new path. And now I regret it. Going down at a side angle rather than straight down was taking longer and with the heavy cover of the trees it was now almost pitch black. I did bring my flashlight and continuing my descent, it just hit me that it was completely silent. Like dead silent. No birds, no squirrels, and no cicadas like before. Just silence. Now, I knew this was weird, but I just brushed it off thinking that maybe it was because I was there. So I kept walking. I should have heeded the warning for silence, but I didn't. About 15 minutes after I noticed the silence, I noticed Fred was acting strangely. Like he was in hunt or alert mode. He ran a little bit in front of me and stopped and looked back at me like he wanted me to stop, so I did. I also had this feeling of dread just take over me. We weren't far from the clearing where we ate earlier, just we were a little parallel to it. He was staring in its direction, and his head on his back of his neck was standing straight up and his ears were pinned back and every time I would try to walk towards him he would growl at me. Keep in mind, this dog never growled at me before or showed any sign of aggression so I knew something was near that he really didn't like. I stood there for maybe another minute or two waiting for him just to keep going, but he never moved a muscle. 
That's when I started to smell this ungodly stench. I mean, it was unbearable. My first thought that it may have been the skunk we seen earlier, but this wasn't a skunk smell. This smelled like more like a weak old rotten carcass or some sort of meat that had been dead long, long ago. It made my eyes water and burn the back of my throat every time I took a breath. It made me gag so much to the point that I threw up. I tried to move on down the hill to attempt just to get away from the thing, but oh my gosh, it was so hard to get Fred. Fred ran back in front of me and growled at me again and started walking towards me, growling as if pushing me in the opposite direction. Seeing his reaction and hurrying my pace, I lost my balance on the steep hillside and tripped over a large protruding tree root, and before hitting the ground I tried to catch myself on a small tree. When I grabbed it, it snapped because it didn't support my weight, and I pretty much just went straight to the ground. I started to hear tree branches breaking and twigs breaking as if something had heard me and was coming towards me. After about three snaps, it stopped. I listened for a moment and didn't hear anything else, so I figured whatever it was stopped and I brushed it off as a coyote or something. Although it sounded like it was a lot bigger than a coyote, and at this point I just wanted to get home because I was completely scared and it was dark now. So I picked up the flashlight that I dropped when I tripped and started to take a step when Fred ran right out in front of me and didn't growl but nipped at me so I wouldn't, like, keep going. I just kept wondering what his deal was. Then about that time, I heard the noise again. But this time, the steps were much closer, and I started to feel the fear rush through me. Now, when Fred usually sees or hears something, he books it right towards it. This time, he was standing completely still, except for shifting from left to right, as if to say, in between me and something else. I showed my flashlight around where I was standing frantically, looking for whatever had him in guard dog mode, but I didn't see anything. Then I heard another crack and whipped my light beam into the direction that it came from, and my light wasn't bright enough to see any details, but in the distance, probably about 50 feet or so in front of Fred, was a huge outline of some kind of thing. It did look like some kind of animal, because it... It was on all fours, but it was just too dark to make out anything else really. Still seeing something this big, and I'm thinking bear at this point, I started backing up very slowly. But every step away from it would just make it come closer. I don't really know how to explain this, it was just so nerve wracking. At this point, I was getting really freaked out, so my instinct was to just run like hell. So I turned around and started running down the hillside as fast as I could without falling, and Fred flipped. He ran right behind me, growling and barking at me. He nipped at me and caught the back of my pant leg and I fell. I stood back up and not 15 feet in front of where I was falling was this... thing. I looked in front of me where it stood, and realizing what I thought it was, it just made me angry for Fred acting the way he was just looked like a huge deer. Like a really huge deer. So I yelled at him, Fred, that's a damn deer, dude, chill out. After I said this, it raised up on its hind legs. I thought to myself, wait, hold up. So when I show my flashlight on it, I got a better look at it. And now I wish I really hadn't. Because what I saw is burned in my mind. It did look like a deer, but it looked like it was dead, long dead. I could see pieces of skin and hair missing. It had legs bent like a deer, but a misshapen deer, like they had been broken and healed back all wrong. Its face, its face scared the unholy hell out of me, more than anything. It had an elongated like snout, but I could see a lot of the skull was protruding, like it was half rotted. Its teeth were long and sharp, and looked like it was too big for its mouth. It had no lips, almost like it had gnawed them off itself. I could see the teeth, roots, and all in its mouth. Its eyes were sunken back into its sockets, but glowed a bright yellow in my flashlight. This thing also had an incredible set of antlers, 
They were huge, but they didn't look majestic like a deer or elk. They looked uneven and just unnatural. The height of this thing scared me the most, I think. It had to be easily 9 to 10 feet. I'm 5'6", and it was twice the height of me. As if the rest of it wasn't frightening enough, this thing had hands. On the front legs, no hooves, but hands like a person. But at the end of each finger were dark colored claws. Also, this was what we smelled. This thing smelled awful. We just stood there for what felt like an eternity, staring at each other. I was so scared I felt like I couldn't move, and I felt like my heart was in my throat. Fred was in between me and this thing. He was barking and growling and snapping, and this thing didn't seem the least bit bothered by him, but just continued to stare at me, which scared the living crap out of me even more. I finally snapped out of my trance for a second and started taking a couple of steps backwards slowly. And for every step I would take back, it would come forward and back Fred closer to me. I continued to back up for a while because Fred was at least giving me a barrier. Finally, I realized I wasn't too far from home. I looked down the hill through the trees and could see the pole light that was in front of my house. When I looked back in front of me, it was gone. I quickly scanned the area with my light and didn't see it anymore, and although Fred was still going nuts, I decided to make my chance and run for it. So I took off as quickly as I could and I made it about 100 feet from the bottom of the hill, which led into the driveway of my house. The whole time I was running, I could hear this thing running with me parallel to where I was. It was clearly a lot faster than me and moved through the trees and steep hillside with ease. I knew there was no way I could make it down in time without falling or this thing catching me and doing God knows what. So I stopped and looked around trying to figure out what to do when I spotted it behind a tree about the same distance from me as before. I was trying to think of a way to get away when it hit me that I had my walking stick and spear. I knew it wouldn't do much as I was probably too far to even pierce its skin, but it might at least buy me some time to get off the hill and into my house. So I waited for it to step out from behind me but it just stayed there with its head peeking out, staring at me. So I took a few quick steps and it stepped out in my direction. Here was my chance. I figured this was the only way it might at least give me a chance. I reared back as hard as I could and looked at Fred and yelled as stern as I could, Fred, come now! And I threw the spear at the thing. Of course it just bounced off, but it looked away from me and down at the stick and spear. So. I took off as fast as I could and as soon as I turned I heard this thing let out that scream I heard a couple of months before. But being this close it was ear splitting. I could hear it start moving in my direction. That's when I heard something growling and biting it and then it hit me. Fred wasn't in front of me. I looked back over my shoulder and seen him lunging at this thing. And I heard it let out that blood curdling scream again. Then I heard something land in the leaves on the ground. I knew it was probably Fred that he had slung off, but it was too late to look back. Running down the steep incline was tough and I lost my balance and slid the rest of the way down on my back till I hit the bottom and got up without looking behind me and took off up my driveway and ran into my back door and slammed and locked it behind me. I stood there for a second with my fingers still on the lock and my head leaning against the door, then raced to make sure my front door was locked and let the shades down. My mom was in the room, just standing there, confused. She was sitting there on her bed, and she started to scold me for being gone so late, and then I realized how freaked out I was. She ran up to me and walked over to my bed, and sat me down on there. She started asking what happened, and I couldn't say anything. I just held my arm, which was bleeding from sliding down the hill, and stared at the floor. She went into the bathroom, and got some things to clean the bandage up on my arm. While she was wrapping it, she was glancing around and then she asked me, Where's Fred? I looked up at her tearing up and didn't say anything. I couldn't. She yelled for my dad who was in the living room and told him to get his gun and walk outside to see if he could find Fred. Immediately I sprang up and grabbed his arm and begged for him not to go outside. At least not until morning. Now I usually don't scare easily, so seeing my concern he agreed to go in the morning. I finally snapped out of it after a few hours and told my mom exactly what had happened. Of course she told me it was probably a bear or a rabid buck, 
but I knew it wasn't. It was something else. It had to be. I took a nap, and I woke up a few hours later to the sound of my dad returning, when everything came rushing back to me and I realized it wasn't a dream. Suddenly I remembered Fred. I got up and ran to the back door where he was and asked him if he found Fred. He just put his head down and looked at the floor and solemnly nodded. He had gone back to where I was last night when I made my run and seen blood and fur but no Fred. He noticed a drag trail in the leaves and up the hill to the clearing where I always went. That's where he found Fred, or at least what he thinks was Fred. He said it was pieces of flesh just thrown around like something had swallowed a bomb. So I asked, how can you be sure it was him? Maybe he just ran somewhere else. Then, he sadly reached into his pocket and pulled out Fred's collar, which was stained in black now. I lost it. After that, I have never been back up in those hills, and a few years later I moved to a different area for college. This thing, whatever it was, killed my dog, my best friend, my guardian. I think Fred saved my life that night. Had he not lunged at it and took it attention off of me, who knows what would have happened. I might not be here today. I never heard the scream again, and I've never saw it again. But after that, I didn't have Fred. I never went out after dark, and I started driving to school. When I was about 10, I started going to a camp called YMCA Camp St. Croix. It's located on the St. Croix River in Wisconsin. This camp has had a few good stories, but I can't remember all of them off the top of my head. As I just found this channel and remembered these things, I wanted to share what I could remember. Back when the camp was first being used, a Native American tribe leader slash chief, I'm sorry, I don't really know the definitions, came to a camp and told the owners and counselors that this wasn't their land and that they shouldn't be making a camp on it. They ignored him. Fast forward to when I started going there. There were a few old stories passed down about old counselors and stuff from years before. Even a really scary one that doesn't really have anything to do with skimwalkers. I might share it later. Anyway, one of the stories is of the Slender Man or Shadow Man because Slender was really popular around this time. They said they were long, skinny black figures in the woods that screeched or something. One day, a group of five to seven kids and a well-known counselor went out to the woods and came back scared pretty bad. These kids all said the reasonably same thing. They said there were some black figures in the trees of the woods. They were there pretty close to them, and suddenly they noticed a large man shape. One flew over their heads, and the ground shook like it was an airplane. Nobody really believed them, including myself at first, but I happened to be really good friends with the counselor who was with them because I had been going to this camp for a long time. He told me the same thing as the kids did, but with a little more detail such as the thing flying above being man-shaped. He began to tell me that he saw these grotesque people and shadows in the woods sometimes. I asked him more about the people, not the shadows, and he explained that he would see them out of the corner of his eyes for only a split second. I remembered hearing about skimwalkers and told him about them. When we went to bed, we all brushed them off. A few days later, my group, and some voyagers went on a canoe trip to a campsite where we would stay for two nights. On the second night, me and two other kids were on our way to the outhouse, which was on a gravel path, when I saw... It? Him? I only really think of it as a man, not the man or cryptid, just man. We all stopped and stared, and it stared back. It was so obviously not a human that it left a sinking feeling in my stomach. I don't think I've ever felt so scared. Then, uh, just as fast as it was there, it was gone. Maybe it was a deer standing on its hind legs in the dark or just another camper. But when I think about it, 
it's just kind of a missing space in my memory, or a cutout where man should be. We didn't sleep that night, but one of the kids that were with me needed to use the bathroom, so he just kept walking towards the outhouse and went. When I got back from camp, I got very scared whenever I thought about skimwalkers. Because I thought if I thought about them, then maybe they would come and try to get me or something. The more I thought about it, the thing that I saw seems more to be like the shadow people and the older counselors and kids talked about. When I think about that moment now, I don't feel scared but instead this peace or serenity because for some reason, I don't think whatever it was wanted to harm us or scare us. That's why I think it may be a ghost or some sort of ancestor that got left behind. I think what I saw could be a skimwalker, but it could be something else. I have a sense that it could be something along those lines, I don't know. I thought the best place to share this would be here on this show, since you share so many odd stories like this. You seem to know a lot about Native American beliefs, and may be able to help me figure out what I saw. You might be able to at least find a connection between the tribe leader and chief and the shadow people, and this creature of sorts. Thank you for sharing my story. Before we start, I will preface this with the following. I have always been interested in cryptids, occultism, the paranormal, and all that. But until about two years ago, I was skeptical about it. About two years ago, I started to really look into this stuff with a friend called Z. They had a lot of luck with that kind of stuff. I have experienced a lot since then, including the story that I'm going to share with you. I have continued to delve into the unknown. One final note, I'm not ingrained in the culture much anymore, but I am about one-third to one-fourth native, though not Navajo. Now, about a year ago, I and my friends had decided to go camping up in northern Arizona near Flagstaff. We chose this spot because we all wanted to escape the hell that is the rest of Arizona's weather. Originally, the plan involved more people. But by the time we actually left, we were down to me, my friend Z, V, and P. This worked out though, as it meant we could just take one car, something that may have saved us that weekend. Now, we are by no means experienced campers or anything, but we had the basics. A tent, flashlights, fire starters, and I had my Mosin Nagant. Not the best, I know, but a big round that I could fire fairly simple. I had ample ammo at the time as well. We chose a site based on reviews a bit north of Flagstaff and followed our GPS there through some windy back roads. Eventually we hit a Y intersection and went left as the GPS told us to go. By the time we eventually find a parking area and get out looking for a good campsite, it's well past 10pm. So I take my rifle and flashlight as it's so dark. Z and V also grab flashlights and we head off. We trek through the woods for about 15 minutes, looking for a good place, but to no avail. We were all feeling tense as we searched. Something felt off and we all vocalized it, almost like we were being watched. We start to head back through a clearing we passed to the car, but about three fourths of the way through, I ask Z a question and get no response. Finding this particularly odd, I turn around to find him about halfway back in the field watching behind us, shuffling in place like he wanted to walk back from where he just came from. I called out to him, and he snaps out of it, and swears he only looked back for a second, and catches back up with us. Now, before you say that it tried to get him with some sort of mind power, I doubt this because of what happens later, and that he has acted completely normal and looked normal ever since. We get back to the car without anything else happening, and decided maybe we should have taken the right path at the Y instead, so we drive back. We arrived at the Y, and take the right path this time, but get a whopping 30 feet before we stop. There's a ditch in the road, and we aren't sure if the car can make it over, so Z gets out to check. 
It takes him less than a minute to figure out that it couldn't and walks up to the driver's side window to tell us. It's only after saying the car can't that he freezes in his tracks and starts to stare behind the car. He simply says, Look! in a hurried voice. We all contort ourselves around the car looking through the mirrors in the back window, but we all see it. A tall figure, easily eight to nine feet tall, standing beside a tree, watching us. Once confirmed, Z isn't just seeing things. He basically vaults over the car and dives into the back seat, slamming the door behind. During the commotion, we lose sight of the thing for a moment, and by the time we look back it's still there, but in a different stance, just stalking us. We quickly get a flashlight out of the sunroof while I rapidly load my rifle. During this time it moves again, slightly deeper into the tree line, but it's still watching us. We are stuck in a staring match for what feels like forever, as we are too concerned backing up will make it strike and currently, it isn't for whatever reason. Eventually, something broke our line of sight with it. I can't quite recall what. I believe I was trying to get people to move so I could line up a shot through the back window, but I can't be sure. And knowing what I do know now, it probably wouldn't have done much of anything. Regardless in this time frame, we lost it as it presumably fell more into the woods. We wasted no time slamming it into reverse turning back to where we originally came from and gunning it. I kept my window down with the barrel out facing the woods it went into. And while I never fired, I swear I saw something dart around in the darkness. I am sure that it chased us because of that. And from the scream we all heard while driving away, it sounded feminine, but not quite human. And the way it was, it was, it was just so loud, so piercing, the way it sounded was just so, so unnatural. It couldn't be anything good. It had to be evil. We decided to stay in a motel that night in Flagstaff and went back to Phoenix the following morning. That's how the story ended until earlier this year. For those of you who live in Arizona, you probably heard last winter Flagstaff got hit pretty hard with a big snowstorm. Naturally, I went up right after the snowstorm ended to have some fun with friends in the cold sled, that kind of stuff. I hate the never-ending heat the rest of Arizona has to offer. So Flagstaff is my getaway whenever I want to do cool stuff to cool off, and it's easier now because I have some friends who live up there and go to NAU. We'll call them L and W. I went up with two other friends, R and Q. Most of the trip was fun, and I did experience some stuff though mostly unrelated to this. The second to the last, though, we decided to go sledding on a particularly good hill, for it was near the sports center, around the arena and stadium both. It sounds too grand, but it's like where you play football or something. I don't know, I'm not really into sports. The sledding was fun and all, but after me and Al, who, like Z, was also very uh, cold and ready to go inside, we, we felt off. Meanwhile, L told me once we were in the car he did see something pop its head over a hill and stare at him before retreating back away. He said he couldn't see all of it, but it seemed like it was big from the silhouette he could see. This one I'm not so sure of, as I couldn't see it myself, but it definitely felt similar to a year ago. So take the second one with a grain of salt, I suppose. Do you guys think both one or neither were skinwalkers? because I still can't explain the first night no matter how hard I think about it. Thank you for sharing my story. Before I start, I need to give you a bit of background about myself. I'm not willing to give out my name or the county here, but I live in Colorado. I'm posting this simply because I'm not absolutely sure what is happening. This happened when I was six, but now I am at least five years older. Our family was taking a trip up the mountains, specifically in a cabin owned by my aunt. Near this cabin, 
was a discontinued railroad project, which even tunneled through a mountain. When this happened, it was the near end of the winter months. The result was me spending much more time researching cryptids. Alright, now to the actual story. The entire day had felt off to me. We went on a hike and I, I couldn't hear any birds or animals. And when we were turning around, I started getting excited because I smelled something coppery and thought it might be copper. And the only thing that deterred me is that it felt like something was watching me. I also had this feeling in the pit of my stomach that if I went to go find it, I probably just wouldn't come back. For me, it was like a sixth sense. I just felt it. I don't know what I would do if I didn't feel that. I didn't think it was blood or anything related, but I felt it wasn't safe to chase the smell. This hike was to the eastern entrance of the discontinued railroad tunnel. Then, back to the cabin. My parents wouldn't let me go in the tunnel whatsoever. As in, the second I stepped within 10 feet, they were getting uneasy and were telling me to get away from there, that rocks might fall. They weren't looking at me. They were staring at a pile of rocks taller than the others, illuminated by the light from the other side. The walk back was tense and quiet. I was the only one trying to initiate conversation. As we were leaving the edge, it was when I smelled the copper. As we walked back, my dad kept glancing behind us at random intervals. It was only that night that I actually noticed anything while I was there. There was one bedroom, perfect for a family of four, but it had only one window. I never trusted that window, and I was right not to. That night, my parents were up much longer than usual, but stayed silent. After they fell asleep, I was pondering on their weird behavior, and at what I would guess was close to 2am or so, I felt something off. The room cooled down, and I felt horribly cold for a moment. I felt pure dread, and along with the chill, I could almost feel what seemed like hunger of some sort, burning my face at an angle from the window. Whatever it was, it knew I was awake, and it knew that I could tell it was there. Then I felt it, that same feeling of if I don't do this, I won't get a chance to correct that mistake. So I got up as high as I could and jumped off the top bunk where I was supposed to be sleeping. Then I turned on a lamp and pointed it at the window. While it was in my hands, whatever it was, we had a mutual feeling of, no, I don't like this one. It was pale in the light and my fear probably made me the same color. All that I could see in the window was a nearly white head with pits for eyes, no lips, slightly larger and sharper than normal blood stained teeth, as well as a thin yet broad shoulders and a single blood red hand with abnormally long fingers that ended in needle like points which were hovering, poised to shatter the window. A few seconds after the light hit it, it opened its mouth and let out a muffled scream, blocked slightly by the window, then vanished to the right. The scream woke everyone up, and I was still standing in the dark, pointing a lamp at the window, looking absolutely horrified. My parents finally got me to sleep. I don't really remember how they managed to do that, but the next day while we were heading out, I looked out that window from outside and realized something even more horrifying. This thing had to be at least 8 feet tall, just to have been able to look at the bottom of the window, because there was a ditch around the edge of the cabin. We took one last hike at around 9am. When we looked back in that tunnel, the rocks in the tallest pile had shifted. There was now a deer antler sticking out near the top, and there were no pools of shiny liquid in the cave. The scent of copper was prominent in the area, and now, even the fish in the nearby stream wouldn't surface for air or insects. I would like to some, some sort of like, reassurance on what I saw, 
but I'm not sure. Next winter, me and three friends are going back to that cabin to go, I guess you could say, uh, hunting. This is a story from Africa, and most likely the only skinwalker story from Africa. My uncle, cousin, and I try to go to mana pools often as we can, as we don't like the generic game parks, such as the Kruger National Park in South Africa. All the tourists go there, and it's always packed. Plastic and fake with all the fences, it makes us feel caged. Now, we all have been going into the bush for years, and have most likely been out there for months or years without giving it much thought. Just too bad we have lives and work. The bush is our home away from home. Manipul's Zimbabwe, though, is special in its own. You have lions and elephants walking through your camp. There are cabins as well, but we like the campsites. This one time, we had a Nile crocodile take a zebra not more than 20 meters from our campsite. Yes, it's the real Africa, and not Africa you're shown in your local travel guides. So, this happened when we took our friends from the States to show them the real bush. I, as always, took my hammock and my 375 rifle and Colt 1911 handgun. I still need to protect myself from the hippos and stuff. Once we got there to the campsite and we had to set up, I went for a walk looking for abbey tracks for our friends from across the Great Lake. Nothing bad, a few lions, a cheetah, a zebra, and an elephant had come across where we set up camp. Okay, cool, I thought, they're going to have the fright of their life tonight. I kept on walking around when I saw these strange tracks in the soft sand maybe about 30 centimeters long by 15 wide, looking almost human, but with cat-like imprints. My uncle came from behind me and asked if I had found anything. I showed him the prints asking if he'd ever seen anything like this. He shrugged it off and said it's probably one of those big baboons. We laughed and walked back to the camp. The week was pretty uneventful. We saw some guys downriver fishing. Remember, that will be important. They were so far from us we didn't bother. About five days in, I went paddling downriver to find a good fishing site. Drifting down, I saw some hippos and some lions on the riverbank. They didn't look right though, almost like they were scared. I thought this was odd. This isn't normal behavior for them. I ended up where we saw the other camp. I paddled ashore. The guy who greeted me seemed shaken. I jokingly asked if this was their first time out here. He said yes, and they were leaving tomorrow when they get their car fixed. Something about an animal wrecking the engine. I said I'm sorry, and asked him if the fish were biting here. He looked at me pale and said it's time to leave. The way he looked at me, and said, yeah, mana isn't for everyone. You never know what's around you. Just sent shivers down my spine. When I got back to the camp, I was telling my uncle what happened, and he seemed a little perplexed, but tried to reassure me that, you know, some people just aren't built for this kind of stuff. I jumped into the truck to go on a game drive, taking my friends along with me. My friend's sister is quite uptight and is scared. I'm saying don't panic. If you see one of us panic, then get scared. She laughs and we carry on. We carry on talking and she asked if it was her last night that she was dreaming or did she really see a big animal outside. I said most likely, as we are in the bush, that it was probably a big animal, but I told her not to worry as we have guns that can take down most things. Night came and we were all around the campfire telling scary stories of the bush monsters of Africa. I noticed that people down river are running around frantically. I stop the stories and say, hey guys, watch closely. I look through my scope and what I saw, however, will forever haunt me. This beast was about three to four meters tall, tearing the guy I spoke into that morning, another beast eating what seemed to be a human torso. I put my rifle down slowly. 
I said calmly that we need to go. Looking at my uncle and my cousin, they saw the fear in my eyes. My uncle grabbed my rifle and looked through my scope. I heard him saying, What in God's name? I remember thinking these things haven't seen us. That's why we are still alive. Our friends suddenly catch on and see the fear my uncle and I are caught by. My friend's sister looks through her camera and screams. A few seconds later she says with a scrappy voice, It's looking at us. Suddenly the fear washes over me. I turn around and see my uncle loading stuff into the truck. My cousin and friends are running around grabbing stuff. Within minutes everything was mostly packed when we heard a branch break. The only sound we had heard. I stand dead still. Everyone else freezes on the spot, listening. The river was to our backs. I slowly gesture to everyone to get to the river, on to the cannons. The only thing I thought of what could save us were the crocs and hippos. We all slipped down the riverbank while these things were just outside of the light of the fire. All of a sudden this thing cries out like a hippo had been eaten alive while giving birth. Going on for what seemed like forever, we managed to get into the boat and softly paddle away from the bank. What we saw standing on top of the riverbank's clear and in full view can't be described. Blood running from its mouth. My cousin shot at it. It seemed like it didn't even feel it. It stood there tall, pacing up and down the riverbank for the night. We couldn't sleep. Daybreak came and that thing walked back into the bush. The park rangers saw us on the boat and were worried that we were poachers. It was a relief to see other humans. Guns were drawn on us and we explained it all. The police said we were the only people in the park camping. We went to the other campsite and it was empty other than those strange tracks. It's gotten me thinking, are the rangers feeding this thing? Or don't they care? Or are they covering it up? Or what's happening? I never heard anything of those other campers. One thing, I'll never go to the same part of that park. I still go to the park itself, however, I know it's watching me. And next time we meet, I'm going to try to take it home, dead. Hey Swamp, this is a bit shorter than most stories you read, but a very interesting skinwalker story. So, at my uncle's funeral, we were telling stories about skinwalkers. Now keep in mind right now we are in Oklahoma, but the first part of this story took place in Arizona. So further on, we were telling stories about my mom's boyfriend. My mom's boyfriend walks up shortly after this and starts telling a story. He said one time, when he was about 17, he was partying with friends out in the middle of the desert, and then his ex-girlfriend got upset at one of his friends, so she walked about a mile down the desert road and he felt bad, so he drove to her in his old Camaro. He hopped out and said, Hey, you wanna t just walk around for a minute, talk about it, just us? And she says yes. So they walk around for about five minutes. He says, have you ever heard of a skimwalker? And she says, yes. And so he told her about how they are attracted to you if you talk about them, apparently. And she just laughs it off. They decide to walk back to his Camaro, when all of a sudden this funky looking man walks out of the middle of nowhere in the pitch black desert and says, hey, can I get a ride? He said he'd never hopped in the car. And drove off faster than he did that day. So, that was the end of his first story. Part two, he told us about the big black dog that used to come around and throw his mastiff and St. Bernard around like rag dolls. And he said one day, he shot at it and that dog never came back. The very next day we were driving in the middle of nowhere like where houses wouldn't be for miles in Oklahoma. And all of us saw this big black dog on the side of the road staring at us. And boy, did I almost pee my pants. Thanks for sharing my story, Swamp. I appreciate ya. If any of you guys know what this could be, please let me know in the comments.
Thanks for listening to these creepy Skimwalker and Wendigo stories. If you enjoyed these stories, please hit that like button as it helps me out a ton. If you have a story you would like to share in a future video, whether it be a Skimwalker story, a Wendigo one, or something different, please be sure to submit it at swampdweller.net or the email you can find in the description down below. I would love to share your story with everyone here in the swamp, and stories like yours that help keep this show going. If you're new to the swamp, why not join us? Hit that subscribe button and turn on notifications to never miss a new video. I upload them almost every single day, and all things natural and supernatural. If you're not aware, you can download your favorite Swamp Dweller scary stories on Spotify, iTunes, Stitcher Radio, and just about every other major podcasting platform. Thank you guys for always supporting the Swamp. Without you guys, I couldn't be doing this every single day. If you're not aware, you can save about $5 right now on anything in the Swamp Dweller merch store. It's getting cold out there. I've got socks, shirts, hoodies, mugs, and just about everything else you could ever want. Some of these stories are really mysterious today. It's kind of creepy to think that you can go to a campsite for so many years and nothing happened. Then all of a sudden you go there and this creature has made it their home. And that one in Africa, really strange. What do you guys think that could be? If you made it all the way to the end, today's code word is Orange Wendigo Sauce. Comment that down below and I will see you guys soon with another creepy video.